bumper. We're going to talk about sex today. <laughs> My name is Cedric Lundy, and I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Watershed. In 1994, 27 years ago, was one of the most formative summers and experiences of my life. I went to this big, huge, mega youth conference called DC 94. And at that conference, there was over 20,000 teens and apparently adult chaperones or whatever. There was, there was a lot of us. And they had all of like the coolest and hippest Christian artists and, 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 and preachers. So like Josh McDowell was a pretty big deal. And uh, Amy Grant came and sang, and DC Talk was there, and Newsboys, and Audio Adrenaline, and a lot of you are like, who are these bands, and who are these people? And others of you are being triggered just by me mentioning those names. <laughs> but at DC 94, that summer with my church youth group, I made three pretty significant commitments or promises, only one of which I have not been able to keep. Number one, it was the first time in my life that I can say I actually felt a call to full-time vocational ministry. I was in between my sophomore and junior year of high school, but I thought to myself, as I saw all these different speakers coming up and sharing the gospel and all those kind of things, I was like, you know what? I want to do something like that. I want to be able to have that kind of impact. I want to be able to have that kind of influence. Uh, the other commitment I made was to read the Bible every day. And then the third commitment I made was a commitment that all of us who were at that conference were committed to make, were, or encouraged to make, I should say, and it made national news. It was even on the cover of Time or Newsweek, I can't remember which one, but I've Googled it to see if the article is still there in the archives, and it's there. But they had the True Love Waits rally. All oh, right, a lot of you are like, oh gosh, I'm even triggered even more now. <laughs> but yes, I was one of tens of thousands of teenagers who that day was given a little commitment card that on that commitment card said, true love waits. And we were encouraged to sign that card and make a commitment that we, a whole bunch of hormonal teenagers, naive, hormonal, confused teenagers would commit to waiting until we got married to have actual sexual intercourse. It means we could do a lot of other things before we actually got to that. Perhaps, maybe not. I'm not gonna ask for people to confess or anything. But you guys get the idea. And then we took those little cards, we put them in these little plastic uh, uh, holders that were staked into the ground in, in, in the lawn out in front of the, the Washington Memorial, which everyone looks like a phallic symbol, <laughs> right? We put it down on the ground and there's this picture and you just see these sea of cards where all these teenagers had committed to wait for true love. It's like a Disney movie, just a really bad one, where we committed to waiting until we got married to have sex. So now you guys are like wondering, which one did he like uh, not fulfill? I'm not gonna tell you because that's not the point. Some of you already know, but anyway. All right, but that was, like I said, it was hugely formational in my life. And that for the next number of years, for me, so much of my walk with the divine was shaped by those three commitments. And in particular, that one, to practice abstinence, to wait until I got married to have sex, to not have sex outside of marriage. I even wrote a persuasive paper in my AP English class on why it makes sense for someone to wait until marriage to get, have sex, even if it's not motivated by religious uh, 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 inclinations, to which 
Uh, my classmates, some of them immediately teased and harassed me. Ha, ha, ha. Cedric's a virgin. Ha, ha, ha. And then all of the, because, you know, it was the 90s, and we were really stupid and insensitive, and thank God we've had the kind of movements today where now, you know, you don't get called a, uh, 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 a, a gay slur just because you're a virgin. That I got to harass just for even committing to that and talking about it openly. And it was my AP English teacher who stood up and said, hey, you guys say one more thing about his sexual preferences. I'm going to encourage him to sue you guys for sexual harassment. It's like, whoa. But all that being said, like I said, it, it, it really did shape a lot of our lives. Even if we didn't make that commitment, if you were growing up in the midst of purity culture in the mid to late 90s. Like I said, there's a lot of you who are nodding your heads. There's a lot of you that like moaned at some of the things that I have already mentioned, right? Because we were all there. And there's a lot of mess that has been left in the wake of that purity culture movement from the late, uh, the mid to late 90s. That we had then a couple of books, a number of books that came out, but none more impactful perhaps than I Kiss Dating Goodbye. That as I got older, I eventually became a middle school youth pastor. And it's kind of obligatory as a middle school youth pastor that you gotta have a sex talk. But even by then, by the time I was a middle school youth pastor and about to have a sex talk with teenagers, even I was aware of the toxic and damaging ways that um, sexual ethics was taught to me from this whole movement of purity culture. That there is just so many things that were just odd and weird with it. And I can even remember one time when I was in college, I went to a small Christian college, or at least that's the one I graduated from. And there was a group of us that were riding up to Grand Rapids, Michigan to do a homeless service project. And of course, when you have a whole bunch of Christian teenagers or young adults in a van, naturally what comes up is, you know, discussions about marriage. And, 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 and all that kind of stuff. Like, who's, what do you think the one will be like? And, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, people asking questions about, well, what, what do you look for in, you know, a significant other or someone in a relationship with? By then, I was a non-traditional student. I had wasted enough time in college. I was just trying to graduate. I wasn't trying to date nobody. And of course, I'm also driving the van because uh, I was already 25 years old. And... Uh, they asked me, well, Cedric, what is it that you look for in a girl? And with a straight face, I said, a girl who has a big butt and all her teeth. <laughs> and unlike you, none of them laughed. <laughs> and I'm just like, you guys are way too uptight. But that's just even an illustration of, again, how just, just uptight that whole movement had everybody that I didn't want my middle schoolers to grow up in the same way where they didn't feel comfortable being honest, where they didn't feel comfortable talking about these things, where they didn't even feel comfortable in their own body. Because I'll even tell you, as a young black man in a white evangelical church where purity movement stuff was taught, and yes, also the thing that we often looked at to see what not to do was often synonymous with black culture. Like, I was scared of myself. Just the ways that in which those two things overlapped. But I digress. There's a lot of different rabbit trails I could take today. I'm going to try to stick with the script. But... I started to actually write my own sex talk curriculum because I didn't want to pass on those same hang-ups to the kids because it was like purity culture was so obsessed with getting us to the quote finish line as virgins that we weren't prepared for our sex lives in marriage. And so I read different books, not I Kiss Dating Goodbye, and not other ones that use things like bleach and other hazardous materials and glue as metaphors in teaching illustrations or object lessons. I would say I'm going to write my own sex talk curriculum. And so in doing so, I went to scripture. 
And I looked for the different scriptures that talked about God's expectations or the divine's expectations for our sexual lives. And one of the go-to scripture references, one of the first ones that we actually see in scripture that actually talks about sexual immorality, which I only recently discovered that in some translations, it's not even, the heading is not even sexual immorality. It says marriage violations, which should be a clue that maybe the way it's been read is not maybe the sole way that we should interpret or view it. And it comes from Deuteronomy, you know, one of those books that has nothing but rules and laws that no one actually reads unless it's to cherry pick different verses to tell kids to basically wait until they get married to have sex. And starting in chapter 22, verse 13, it says the following. Now, brace yourselves. Remember, this is Old Testament stuff, okay? So a lot of these things that it's going to say sounds very odd or just straight up strange to the modern ear. All right. If a man marries a woman, sleeps with her, and then turns on her, calling her loose, giving her a bad name, saying, I married this woman, but when I slept with her, I discovered she was a virgin, then the father and mother of the girl are to take her with the proof, proof of her virginity to the town leaders at the gate, as if that wouldn't be embarrassing. The father is to tell the leaders, I gave my daughter to this man as wife, and he turned on her, rejecting her. And now he has slanderously accused her, claiming that she was, wasn't a virgin. But look at this. Here's the proof of my daughter's virginity. And then he is to spread out the blood-stained wedding garment before the leaders for their examination. Yes. It's weird. <laughs> the town leaders then are to take the husband, whip him, find him a hundred pieces of silver, and give it to the father of the girl. The man gave a virgin girl of Israel a bad name. He has to keep her as his wife, and he can never, ever, ever divorce her. It doesn't say never, ever, ever. I'm just keeping you engaged. But if it turns out that the accusation is true and there is no evidence of the girl's virginity, the men of the town are to take her to the door of her father's house and stone her to death. She acted disgracefully in Israel. She lived like a whore while still in her parents' home. Purge the evil from among you. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both must die. Purge that evil from Israel. If a man comes upon a virgin in town, a girl who is engaged to another man and sleeps with her, take both of them to the town gate and stone them until they die. The girl, because she didn't yell out for help in the town, and the man, because he raped her. Violating the fiancé of his neighbor. You must purge the evil from among you. But if it was out in the country that the man found the engaged girl and grabbed her and raped her, only the man is to die. <coughs> the man who raped her. Don't do anything to the girl. She did nothing wrong. This is similar to the case of a man who comes from across, who comes across his neighbor out in the country and murders him. When the engaged girl yelled out for help, there was no one around to hear or help her. When a man comes upon a virgin, he has never been engaged, who has never been engaged and grabs and rapes her, and they are found out the man who raped her has to give her father 50 pieces of silver. He has to marry her because he took advantage of her and he can never divorce her. A man may not marry his father's ex-wife. What? That would violate his father's rights. Okay, so this text, which seems to have a lot more about rape is one of like the foundational pieces of purity culture's message of true love waits and waiting until you get married to have sex, not having sex outside of marriage. And even as I looked at it then, as I was preparing the sex talk that I was gonna give to middle school students, I had this thought of this text seems wildly obsessed. Thank you. You could hear that in my voice? Oh. Hello 
excited to get rats meat. <laughs> but that text seemed wildly, wildly obsessed with the sexual status of the bride, of the woman. As if to suggest the bridegroom, the man, could do whatever the hell he wanted. But even then, as a middle school pastor who grew up in purity culture, who heard over and over and over again all these things about sexual purity and how it seemed like God was mainly, primarily concerned with my sexual life, even then, in my head, I said to myself, well, it must be implied. It must be inferred that the man is also supposed to wait until he gets married. But what I didn't realize and what didn't help me, what I was missing to be able to properly understand not only this text, but a lot of the texts in the Bible that is concerned with sexual mores is patriarchy. I had no concept for how patriarchy was informing not only just the text and how it was read and understood, but the very men who wrote, recorded, and edited scripture that we have today. I had no concept for how patriarchy was informing this. So, we talk a lot about patriarchy. I thought it'd be a good idea to actually give a definition of what patriarchy is. Patriarchy is social organization marked by the supremacy of the father in the clan or family. The legal dependence of wives and children and the reckoning of descent and inheritance inheritance in the male line. Therefore, the men have a disproportionately large share of power in society. In other words, patriarchal societies are primarily concerned with maintaining male power. They function in such a way to coalesce wealth and power into the hands of the male head of a family and his subsequent heirs subsequent male heirs. Therefore, it should come as no surprise that the two greatest threats to patriarchy is not whether or not people wait until they get married to have sex. Actually, the two greatest threats to patriarchy is infertile women and gay sons. Just think about it. If patriarchy is based on the inheritance, the wealth of the father being passed on and continuing, then a wife who is unable to have children because God forbid that the infertility might have something to do with the guy, which I have a funny story about that for another time. But anyway, I digress. No rabbit trails. The other thing that would pretty much end your line is having a son who's not going to have any children with a woman, having a gay son. So that's why Scripture seemed so obsessed with, one, the status of the bride, and the groom could do whatever he wanted, but also looked at homosexuality as something that was, in its words, abhorrent, because it was, quote, offensive to their society being organized around patriarchy. Not the actual act, but just the fact that it was considered a threat to their society being organized around male patriarchal headship. So when I began to understand and consider how patriarchy was informing biblical texts, there were portions of it that just made a whole lot more sense. So, for example, in the book of Ruth, at the beginning of the book, what do we have? We have Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws, right? And usually the way that book is taught, right, is all kinds of crazy stuff just to get women to basically know their place. When in reality, what we see is, is when 
Uh, and now I'm going to butcher the names of the two ladies. But when the two daughter-in-laws, right, are, are, are both widowed, what do we have? We, they don't leave or they're not even, you, you have Ruth, or, or sorry, you have Naomi who says to the two of them, you're free to go. And so we look down or we're taught to look down at the one who basically got her freedom and went the other way. And then we applaud Ruth for sticking around when in reality, here's the thing. In patriarchy, the wife technically was property of first and foremost, the groom or the husband's father and mother. They, in that society, weren't actually permitted to leave until Naomi actually gave them permission. She's literally releasing them from them being her property. She is relinquishing her ownership of those two young ladies. That in that system, marriage, <laughs> marriage was not about the sanctity, you know, and holiness of marriage. And look, I've been married now 14 years. I'm not trying to slag off marriage. But from a biblical standpoint, when we see all these things that are talking about biblical marriage and what it's about, no, 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 no. Let me tell you something. Biblical marriage in the Old Testament, it was a business transaction. That's it. It was a business transaction where goods and property were being exchanged between the two heads of a household. You give me your daughter to give to my son, and I will give you in return livestock. Property for property. And, you know, today terminology in sports, you basically have to make sure the contracts or the value of both, you know, uh, 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 properties, goods that are being exchanged line up. You can't have somebody giving, you know, way more livestock than what this young lady, you know, merits. And you can't have you giving, you know, livestock that doesn't meet up to the standard of this young lady that you're giving exchange. That's it. And that whole entire text that I read in Deuteronomy is mainly concerned with the fact that you don't go messing with the value and assessment of another man's property. Because if you go and you sleep with her, you've now affected how much he can get for her on the market. That it wasn't obsessed or concerned with sexual purity and holiness and the sanctity of the marriage, but it was concerned with protecting capital. It was concerned with protecting the commodification of women and their bodies. So then when you get Jesus in the New Testament, in uh, Matthew chapter 22, verses 23 through 30, the Sadducees, that same day, Sadducees who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow. This is a concept called kinship redeemer. And raise up offspring for him. In other words, so that his line doesn't end. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and the third brother, right down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven? since all of them were married to her, but none of them had a child with her. Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. Now, growing up, when I heard this, it was used or it was taught as a way of saying, well, you know, in heaven, we will ultimately get our satisfaction from God and our relationship to God, that we're so close now to God that we don't need marriage. We don't need to, you know, have that kind of union and companionship with other people because we will be totally fulfilled with God. That's not what it's saying. When you start to see it through patriarchy, what God is saying in heaven at the resurrection, this system where women are commodified and belong to a man is long gone. It does not belong nor has no place in the kingdom of God to which Jesus taught us to pray. May it be on earth as it is in heaven. 
So, again, this isn't about sexual purity. This is about how we have been oftentimes raised, whether in the church or out of the church, whether in Christian culture or just the culture at large, right? Because both of them suffer from the same thing. We like to look at the Mideast and we like to criticize the way women are treated there. And in reality, in the U.S., all we have is a light form of patriarchy. It's just as bad, it's just as insidious, it's just as toxic. It does damage to men and women. In the meanwhile, we read texts about Solomon having over 300 wives and 600 concubines, and we're like, dang, he was a pimp. <laughs> right? I mean, long before Cat Williams said it, pimping, and pimping, baby. Right? No. For those of you who know who Cat Williams is. <laughs> but... That text is not telling us about Solomon's, uh, you know, basically how much gain he had. No, it's basically telling us that Solomon was ridiculously, insanely, otherworldly wealthy. Because you had to be stupid rich to be able to have that many women as your property. It's amazing how patriarchy gets you thinking like, man, how did he get around to all those women to understanding he didn't need to? It was like no different than saying, look how many cattle I have out in the field. So, we could talk at length about how patriarchy, how purity culture has adversely been this system of oppression against women. And there's a lot of material out there on it. There's a lot of scholars. There's a lot of theologians. There's a lot of women who are confessing and testifying to the toxicness of patriarchy and uh, purity culture. But today, for my purposes, I want to talk about something else. You see, back in December, of last year, a Christian theologian by the name of Jory Micah inquired on Twitter, I know the many ways in which purity culture harmed women, but have any of you men who grew up in white evangelicalism been able to define and articulate how purity culture has impacted me? Well, well. I'm known to some as the mayor of Facebook. For those of you who follow me on Facebook, you get it. I'm like the exact opposite on Twitter. But I decided, you know, she asked, I'll share. So the first thing I said, ways that purity culture harmed men. Purity culture inextricably binds men's understanding of their godliness to the social construct of masculinity. So even our attempts to be godly are mired in inherent toxicity. That so often, Purity culture encouraged us as men to be just this version of masculinity that doesn't help anybody. If you want an example, listen to the podcast Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. It is anecdotal because they're not the only ones who suffer from this. They're the extreme version, but I'm here to tell you as somebody who was in full-time pastoral ministry during much of that era, it was rampant. Again, lighter versions of what Mark Driscoll was doing, but it was rampant. And just how that masculinity felt it needed to be expressed. Second, by encouraging us to view women as property of their father, and future husband, little do we realize we also objectified ourselves and made ourselves little more than a buyer on the supply chain. And that's not to say that the way that purity culture has affected or harmed men is worse than what it's done or the same as it's done to women, but this is how we as men have oftentimes uniquely experienced it. 
I'll never forget sitting down in a restaurant with a father because anytime I did the sex talk as a middle school youth pastor, I always went through the sex talk with the parents first so that way they could make an informed decision about whether or not they wanted their kids to be part of the sex talk. And I had a dad who wanted to sit down with me and he was concerned with one of the things that I was going to talk to the students about. And it was this idea that if you end up having sex before marriage, that you are not somehow used goods. That as a friend of mine once said, God does not do a half-assed job of forgiveness. He was concerned that saying that might send the wrong message. And he was concerned specifically about his daughter because, you know, he wanted his daughter to be able to, you know, be looked at and viewed in a certain way. And what I found really interesting is he made no mention of his sons. Third, we are all ill-equipped to navigate things like infertility, and declining libido. That men are often given no avenue, no way to really be able to talk about it, to process it, that we are oftentimes abandoned and left to try to navigate things like infertility, and then in particular, declining libido on our own. The fact that in some ways, we are basically sent this message, not overtly, sometimes overtly, depending on what expression of white evangelicalism you grew up in, that basically if you just wait until you get married, then you will be rewarded with a wife who is always willing, ready, and able. And even when she's not, she will. And so we have, we are ill-equipped to deal with just the fact these things happen, and that they are a part of the human experience. Four, we are ill-equipped to express our needs and expectations beyond quoting select passages from the Song of Solomon. <laughs> I'll take by the laughter that you guys are already thinking of illustrations of that. <laughs> Fifth, because purity culture is a byproduct of disembodied theology and is obsessed with getting to heaven and pleasing God, we're slow to pursue matters of justice on earth that God cares about. We are so concerned with staying a virgin until marriage, we got no time for nothing else. I wish... I could get back those years where I wasn't so... <sighs> the framework for the kind of Christianity and, and spirituality that I was given was primarily concerned about sex. It was not concerned with matters of justice, unless it was occasionally going on an overseas mission trip or going and serving the homeless. It had no framework for actually helping me see matters of justice that I literally live and breathe now. That it had me so, so wrapped up in purity culture that I had no concept for white supremacy outside of Klansmen. Which, of course, living in Michigan, hey, we're in the north, so I had no concept of northern racism, which, y'all, it's just as bad. They just didn't put the signs up. But you can listen to other sermons I've done on that. But you guys get the idea. It was only obsessed with that, nothing else. And that one leads to the last one. All these years later, I'm convinced that purity culture wired me to be as obsessed with not having sex as much, if not more, than other guys who were trying to have sex. And I'm just talking about the amount of time in my head that that was the thing that I was thinking about, which then also has this way of skewing the way that you would look, that I would look at women, because then you're only seeing them as basically somebody that you might end up marrying so you can sleep with or someone you're not going to sleep with at all, which again, objectifies them. 
And my saving grace for me personally was I was raised in a house where my parents parented in such a way that they were equals, that I had two older sisters, and that I was taught to respect women to the point that I was a little bit of an anomaly where I was actually able to form non-sexual friendships, relationships, like close friendships with women, which oftentimes in the white evangelical world, especially as a black guy, put me under great suspicion of being a player. Well, he must be up to something because I've had guys, I've heard guys talk about how they wouldn't even engage or interact with a girl who they were not romantically interested in, which is their loss. That they did not have a framework for actually like being able to become friends with a woman to the point that other guys who were actually able to have friendships with women, able to actually hug women, that it wasn't like, oh, they have an ulterior motive. So, as I was preparing this message and tossing it around in my head and where I was gonna go and whatnot, at first I was thinking, maybe my application or my closing point is to suggest a new sexual ethic. Which, let's be honest, at Watershed, we're really not in need of a new sexual ethic counter to the purity culture one, right? We have created a space where we're at least on the trajectory that we see in scripture, that if you start with Genesis 1 and work your way through seeing the lens of patriarchy, you can actually perhaps see that the divine has been actively subverting patriarchy from the very beginning. That in the beginning, he created them male and female. That there's not this delineation that was meant to be unequal. That the inequality, if anything, is a byproduct of, quote, the fall. But we see Deborah the prophetess. We see Hagar, who is literally the first person in all of Scripture to actually give God a name. That we see that it's the women who are the first ones to come upon Jesus' empty tomb, which only makes sense since they were the ones who primarily financially invested in his ministry. Which it kind of makes you wonder, why would God be concerned with our stupid arguments about complementarianism and egalitarianism when clearly the women were funding his life? Again, I digress. But see, that's the thing. That Deuteronomy text, it's not about sex. It just kind of rhymed. That Deuteronomy text is about patriarchy. It's about that framework that puts men on top, that views women as little more than goods and property, that makes human interactions between people created in the image and likeness of God little more than some kind of financial framework of goods and property being exchanged in transactions. So literally on the way here this morning, I said to myself, no, Cedric, the point isn't about a new sexual ethic. The point that you need to be living out and that you need to encourage this community of watershed to do is to continue to subvert, tear down, and take apart patriarchy because it is killing all of us. And what that looks like for you in your specific context, I don't know. But whether it's women being financially compensated equally in the workplace, 
whether it's being willing to allow your wife to keep her last name, whether it's, I don't know, maybe even encouraging our daughters to keep their last name, whether it's just continuing to do the little things that don't continue to perpetuate this system of patriarchy, where we're viewing women as goods and property. We have got to be about the business of continuing to be on the trajectory that the divine has clearly in the text set us upon that we should quite honestly be further along in than we are today. That we could say when we look at human relationships, in particular the relationships between those in our gender constructs who are categorized as male and or female, that it would be on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.